just made a note it's in the questions channel so you can be listening to this stream and go into the text channel it's called questions and any questions that we're going to have during the meeting you can ask there if you have a mic uh, we'll ask you to raise your hand and you can speak if you want so i totally understand if you don't want to uh, actually speak up it may be intimidating for some people to speak in front of an audience so ask questions there we'll go through that and then uh, we can uh, we can go with the audience here too so you can ask them directly here by raising your hand so I'll just go ahead and get started I see we have 10 people in the audience awesome to have everyone here so the main thing that I wanted to do here differently from any previous course that I've done is uh, create a way for students to interact with each other and not just to interact with each other because I know a lot of discord servers can just kind of appear and then disappear really quickly because there's no engagement so the objective here was to create engagement between students and teacher's assistants. At this point, you're seeing Praveen and Abhi uh, in, the, uh, in the chat here. So you're seeing them and those two are official TAs here. So they will be TAs we can work with. I encourage everyone to try to assist each other as we go through the projects, but know that it's physically impossible for me to, uh, to get to everything. So they're gonna be assisting everyone. They're not here to help with homework. They're here to uh, kind of moderate and make sure that people are having questions answered and that these meetings go well. So questions can be answered by them, by me and so on. And then eventually I will bring on more teacher's assistants. So moderators, teacher's assistants. And if any one of you want to become a teacher's assistant at some point, if you just wanna help out, you absolutely can. That would be amazing. Uh, we are looking for help. Praveen and Abhi are uh, officially on staff though. so. Uh, at some point, maybe if your Django skills improve, this can be a, uh, a paid gig for you. So we're looking forward to that. So I put out a question. I wanted to see where everyone was at. At some point, I'm trying to figure out if we should create some kind of form. I would love to see like a profile on each student. And what we could do is even create an option to do that on dev search just for, uh, just for the students in here because I would love to see where everyone's at and where, uh, where you're at in your Django journey, what you're trying to accomplish, uh, your career experience and so on. I feel like that would be a good way to gauge everything here. Cool, so everyone's mics will be muted automatically. We're gonna have Praveen and Abhi take care of that. So, okay, here we go. We have, okay, I guess I'll, I'll give that a second while everyone's mics are being muted. <laughs> so we have our introduction and the basics. I'm curious on where everyone's at. I, uh, I think where people were responding. If you can, tell, tell me where you're at in the course. How far have you gotten in here? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Wow, my bad. Give me a second. So I'll share my second screen. I'm gonna try making sure the resolution is good. And I'll zoom in too. So if I'm too zoomed out, let me know. So let uh, me... Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. So we're gonna we're gonna mute everyone's mics uh, unless you request it in the questions channel, and then uh, Abi or Praveen will approve you. And I see Shuvo here. So Shuvo is a uh, is the awesome designer that built the template. So everyone, uh, Shuvo, you're gonna become a celebrity in here soon because you did an awesome job. And it looks like he's gonna be learning Django with us because he's a React and CSS person. Okay, so if everyone in the questions channel can tell me where they're at in the course, let us know if you if you started it at all, if you uh, if you're on a specific module, just let me know. But it'd be cool to see where you all are, are at here. So in the course here, we have the introduction and the basics. This is what we'll do right now. I'd love to see where this at. So while you guys are responding, uh, let me just get started. So I guess I could run through my slides here. Let me pull those up. So we have the introduction to Django. I'll, I'll just go without slides. I'll, I'll stick to to uh, to the basics here. So while everyone's answering, I'll start with what is Django, and we'll go from there. If I'm at a too beginner of a level, let me know. I just want to make sure everyone can follow. But uh, as mentioned in the course, if you haven't seen that video, Django is just a backend web framework, and it uses the Python syntax. So if you don't know Python before this, I'd highly recommend checking Python out. Uh, just to understand the syntax; it's going to be helpful. One thing about this is I've actually seen people learn Python through Django. So that's a kind of an interesting thing. I wouldn't recommend it because I think the issue occurs or the issue that occurs at this point is that people run into Python issues, but they think they're Django issues because they don't know the difference. But I have seen people do it, so it's possible, but I'd highly recommend uh, 
picking up bolts. So yeah, it's basically a backend framework for Python. Uh, some people ask questions like, why do we even need a framework? I think a good answer for this is kind of like the idea of building out uh, something completely by hand. If you were to build it completely out by Python or with Python, you would have to be writing a lot of code yourself, importing a lot of custom modules and so on. So web frameworks make it very easy and they kind of configure everything for us. Uh, think of it as any other Python module that you imported. There's things for data science, for machine learning. Uh, all that's built in Python, but you have very smart developers before you that came before you that build all this out and basically make it easy so you can focus on the good stuff. Because if we all started from scratch, we would be... Uh, if we can mute some mics here, by the way. I see someone had a horn in their background. Uh, that's mine, I think. Oh, Okay. So yeah, it, it basically makes for development a lot easier. Now, front-end frameworks are different from back-end frameworks, so we're gonna go all the way back here. There's front-end frameworks like React, uh, Vue.js, Angular. Uh, these are not needed, but they make for production. Uh, they also make production very fast, and uh, they kind of force you to follow good architecture. You absolutely don't need a front-end framework, but they are, are good to use too. So they are different from backend frameworks. They take care of the front end portion of things. Now, I know a lot of Django developers hate the idea of JavaScript or even using a front end framework. And that's, that's fine in the beginning. At some point, we're all probably gonna have to learn JavaScript if you're a web developer, unless you find yourself a position where you're just working with databases and APIs. But JavaScript is gonna make your website a lot more interactive. We're not gonna be using it in this series. We use it at like one small point, but it's very, very basic. Now, a front-end framework and why you should use that, even though that's out of the scope of this tutorial, but I just wanted to cover that, uh, it's kind of like the same reason and why you would even use a back-end framework. So why do we need Django? We use Django or we use back-end frameworks because we would have to code out a lot of stuff by hand with Python. I think Justin Mitchell has a video on his channel where he's actually building a website completely from scratch and it takes like 40 minutes just to render out a simple template with Python. So with Django, you can do that in five minutes or less than that. So a front-end framework, when you get to that point, there is a lot of JavaScript interaction that will make your website a lot uh, more seamless, I guess. Like things like if you're looking at an Instagram clone, let's say when you click the like button or when you, post, or when you put out a, a message, you see this data instantly. You're able to toggle certain things like a drop-down menu and so on. Uh, this is stuff that JavaScript can do for your website. So a front-end framework is going to make that a lot cleaner. It's going to make it a lot simpler. It, there is a learning curve, but it could get a little bit challenging for beginners. So yeah, that's kind of the introduction to Django. There's also Flask. That's really, I would say, the only competition to Django. And even that isn't really competition in my opinion. I think Django is just so advanced and so powerful, even though it is more opinionated in a heavyweight framework. Uh, that just means that more stuff come with it. Uh, I still think it's highly customizable and it's absolutely the best framework for Python. I, I guess best isn't the best thing to say or the right thing to say because there are scenarios where Flask may be good, but it's just extremely powerful and I think we are, you're gonna be good with that. So uh, let's see, I'm seeing the questions here or the people responding with their status. We got a couple, yeah, a lot of people here are saying that they finished installation and setup, uh, you know, they're beginners basic sections, I, I guess it's, it looks like. Uh... So we'll get things going. There's a GitHub repo, we won't get into that. I'm gonna start it from scratch. I see people uh, have finished the introduction or installation and setup. So we're gonna run through that pretty quick here in the course, it's 17 minutes long, but we'll just get through that and then uh, we'll move on quickly. So I just wanna get the basics complete here. So again, keep asking questions uh, along the way, absolutely love it maybe try to keep them more focused on uh, where we're at here right now. But if they are out of the scope a little bit, I'll still try to address them. So when I'm live coding or when I'm doing a tutorial, the funny thing is I have to zoom in like crazy. So for you all, the screen probably looks pretty normal, but I'm zoomed in at 175%. So uh, let's go ahead and create our first Django application. And this is where all the questions are probably gonna come in. This is gonna be good here. Uh, I'm gonna start with my command prompt here. I'm gonna drag this into frame. And the first thing I wanna do is create a virtual environment. So I think we're all familiar with virtual environments. That's in the tutorial. If you're not, you can ask the questions, but that's more of a Python thing. We're gonna create a virtual environment just to separate out all of our installs. So I'm gonna create my project on my desktop 
and I'm just going to CD in there and I want to create that virtual environment. And to do that, if you haven't done this already, this is in the course, we can just pip install virtual ENV. So that's just a module that lets us create a virtual environment. So let's see. Not sure Did I misspell that virtual ENV. I have it installed already, but you can just do pip install virtual ENV and that will get that set up. And we just want to create that environment. So I'm just going to call that ENV. That's typically what I like to call it. So we can just do virtual ENV and then the ENV name or the environment name. So this can be called whatever. That's the way I like to call it. So one second. So this is the problem with live coding is apparently it's not installed. So pip install virtual ENV. There we go. Okay. And then we can do virtual ENV. That's probably a misspell. Yeah, that's a complete misspell. Okay, so that's working and I'm gonna call it ENV here. So that's gonna be my folder name. So this is gonna create a folder for me and this folder is gonna be on my desktop here. So that's gonna be my virtual environment and I'm gonna install Django into that virtual environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag that into frame here and that's gonna be on my left side here. Let's get these files out of here. So that's gonna be on my desktop because that's where I ran it from. We'll drag that in here and there we go. So that's my virtual environment to activate it. We're just going to do ENV because that's the name and then backslash scripts. And I'm using Windows, by the way. So on Mac, it's going to be a little bit different and we can activate it. OK, so the environment's activated. We can see that right here. So if you see the parentheses and ENV, that means you're ready to go. And to install Django and get the latest version, you need Python. So that's what we're using for pip here. That's kind of like the prerequisites. So now we can just do pip install Django. So pip install is a Python thing. We're going to give this a minute here to install Django. We'll get our project set up here. So I'm not going through notes. So if I miss something, let me know, like if you're confused on how I did a specific thing. Okay, so we have Django installed. So to do that, to make sure it's all good here, just go ahead and just do Django dash admin. And this is going to give you a list of commands here. So these are all commands. This means that Django installed and we can run all of these and we're going to be focusing on a few main ones here. So this means that Django is successfully set up here. So for some reason, my terminal looks weird, but we have like the star app command. There's going to be a command called star project uh, run server. This is how we activate our server and then run our migrations here. So Django is successfully installed and we're ready to move on to the next step here. So what I'm going to do, and this is where a lot of people got confused in the course here. I'm going to go ahead and close out my terminal and I'm going to be using VS code. So you can use whatever text editor you want. I'm going to use VS code, but if I use VS code, VS code has an integrated terminal into it and it should activate it right away. So this stream is recorded by the way. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a folder here. We'll go into my desktop. This is where I have my project. Try to zoom in here a little bit. How's my screen size by the way? Okay. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So uh, I, I realize we have not created a Django project. So that's the first thing we want to do. So I'm actually going to open up my text editor again. Yeah, Skip I this. have something to add to the virtual environment. Like uh, sure. people in the beginning uh, sometimes gets uh, confused, like what the hell is going on with virtual environment thing. Mm -hmm. So if you are a beginner, uh, you can totally skip that part. Like you are not going to use uh, any type of uh, like different versions of Django. Uh, any means and uh, yeah, so, like uh, you can totally get rid of that virtual environment. You can just start uh, like with just pip install Django and start creating project. Yes, 100%. So it's great to have a virtual environment. You should have one, but if that confuses you, don't let it stumble you. If this is your first install of Django, yeah, just do pip install Django. You don't need a virtual environment. Uh, it's just it's good for production. Once we're separating out our code, we'll get to it later, but it's not going to stop you from continuing. So we did the Django admin command. We installed Django and using the Django admin command, and I misspell a lot when I'm live streaming, uh, using this command, we see, in, we see we have access to all these other commands here. To start up our first Django project here, we're gonna use this start project command. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna create like these boilerplate files for our Django application. So it's basically just gonna get things prepped for us and uh, we can start building stuff in there. So it's gonna give us pre-built code, just like you would when you uh, set up, I guess, any more, any heavyweight framework like Django. Um, there's a couple of packages and modules that can do this in a different way too. So we won't get into that. Okay. So in that case, we'll do Django dash admin and then start project. And then you want to give your project a name. 
So in this case, the project name is going to be, uh, I'll just call this dev search and then we'll just do live like that because we're doing this live. So that's going to be the project name. So this is going to create a folder on my desktop because I am in my desktop here. So now I can close out my terminal and I'm going to bring in that folder here. So let me find this on my desktop here and the other screen. I'm on a dual screen here. One second. this question advantages between virtual environment pip environment and python virtual environment if you have an answer uh go ahead and do that i uh yeah. i've never like looked into that i know they all work sure. I'll, yeah I'll, I'll take my take on this um you know functionally they really work the same but you know um if you're like a techie and like you're working on a really massive project uh, the, the, you know, each, you know, um, virtual environment tool does work a little differently. For example, with PIP environment, it's actually built on top of virtual ENV. So that would mean that, you know, you're using a lock file to maintain the, the packages and, and, and the libraries that you're using for your project. Um, virtual environment is, is, they really work the same way. You know, do you want a lock file? Do you not want a lock file? But, you know, it doesn't really matter in the beginning. It just matters in really big projects. Good answer. Yeah, that's, a, that's an answer I probably couldn't have given. I haven't looked into that, but thanks for jumping in there. Cool. So uh, let's jump into the next section here. So we started our Django project. We ran the Django dash admin start project. And now we have this folder called dev search live. So we did start project dev search live. So that's what we call our project. So if I open up this folder and right now, by the way, my virtual environment and dev search live are next to each other. So I typically like to put my virtual environment into my Django project. So I like to keep it in there because I, can, I don't lose it that way. So the Django admin start project command gave me these boilerplate files in here. We're going to see a manage.py file and then we'll just break down the other ones in here. And inside of the dev search live project, we're going to see another folder called dev search live and inside of that subfolder. We're going to see a couple of files in here. So this is what we have set up. So we'll go ahead and run through all of these. But before we do that, I'm going to drag my virtual environment into my Django project. So that's where I like to store it. So this is where people got confused or that person got confused last time. So I'm going to open up VS code and I'm going to open up my Django project here. So that was dev search live here. And this text is probably really small here. So I'll zoom in. So I'll just open that up and now I have no, that's the wrong one. Okay, so give me a second. Dev search live. That's the one I needed. Okay, so here is my blank Django project here. So in here, we have a manage.py file. Don't touch this file. Uh, that's uh, something that we can run our commands from. We're going to be using this a lot, but never modify this file unless you know exactly what you're doing, which in the beginning stages, you will not. Uh, then we have our virtual environment, which we just dragged in. And then we have our Django core files. So the main file in here is going to be our settings.py. I'm not going to go through all the parts of it because we'll address these one by one throughout the course or in the live streams here. Uh, but this is like your project configuration file. So if you know, um, if you know, Node.js, this is going to be like your uh, package.json file where you have all your configurations. Uh, basically it's how we set up what database we have. So if we go through this, we have our apps in here, middleware, templates and basically all our project configuration. Here's our database, which is going to be an SQL light database and so on. So settings.py, very important file. The next one in here is going to be our URLs.py. And this is how we configure our URL routing. So I'm going to take out this comment here. I just want to get rid of that. So this file is how we decide what a user sees and what routes are available on our website. So because of VS code, I'm just going to run that install really quick. Don't worry about this. Uh, so this is going to handle all the URL routing by default. We already have one path here. This is just a Python list here and that's how we configure it. Now WSGI here, this stands for web server gateway interface. This is our server right here. And then we have ASGI. So we're not going to touch these two files. Uh, ASGI is going to be for asynchronous server gateway interface. So after Django 3.2, I believe, or 3.0, uh, Django added in async capabilities, which I have not used, but that's what ASGI is for. Then we just have our init.py, which basically just makes it a Python module and that's it. So Django dash admin set this up for us. The main two files that we're going to work with are going to be settings and URLs here. 
Okay, so what was the next step in that series? So after we set up our virtual environment, and by the way, I had people uh, help out with some timestamps. I don't know if we got these ones complete. So that was set up an installation. I think the last step in this process, and I think my video was gonna autoplay there. Uh, the last step in this process was to create our app here. So in Django, this is the concept of apps. I know a lot of people struggle with it. Basically your project functionality and your database and all that is gonna sit inside of something called an app. That's where your core files are really gonna be. This Django project that we set up, this is like your project configuration. So it just gets things set up and registered for us. And then the actual apps is where we're gonna store the logic. So I actually wanna pull up the diagram that I used in the video or in the course here. I'll pull this up here. One second, I have the picture somewhere here. Okay, so this is an unprepared stream. So here's kind of the concept of it. No, that's not apps. I think I actually deleted that, uh, that picture from my desktop. So uh, think of it this way, I guess. Uh, Bucky Roberts, that's actually the person I originally learned Django from, and he said it this way. If you can't describe what an app does in one sentence, it needs to be its own app. So let's say we're using facebook.com, and facebook.com has users, they have a feed, they have groups, there's like Facebook Marketplace, they have all these components of their project. That makes up facebook.com. All of these projects sit in the website, so instead of bundling up all this functionality into one big project and getting it all mixed up here, we would put that into its own app. So users would sit in one app, groups would be in another app and, uh, and so on. So we're just basically separating our code. So now that I'm done with my ranting, let's go ahead and create an app here. So I'm gonna open up my terminal for VS Code. I can just do control shift and then tilde or the back tick there. And this is what I was talking about when I opened up VS Code my virtual environment turned on by default. It activated it because it sits in my Django project. So just go ahead and activate it. If you don't have it activated, just do ENV or whatever you called it, scripts, and then activate. And that will get that active for you. Okay, so now that we're in our Django project, so if you're using a simple command prompt, CD into your Django project. And we're still recording, right? Everyone can hear. Just want to make sure I saw a comment. So we CD into our Django project. So make sure you are now in that folder that you created. Big, uh, or just make sure you follow that. A lot of people try to create their app outside of it. Now from here, you can do Python manage.py start app. So it's kind of like the start project command and this is why we have manage.py here. And then in this case, we're gonna call our app project. So we're gonna have two different apps, one for our projects and one for all of our users. When I run this command, we see a folder called projects now, and this is what an app looks like. So let's kind of run through these files. Models.py, this is our database. This is where we design it. In this case, we build our database tables using Python objects or classes. So we're gonna use these classes and these are gonna represent our tables. We have views. So this is where we're gonna handle the core logic when we, whenever a user uh, goes to a certain URL. So it's gonna trigger a view, and this function will return a template. Uh, it can return a simple HTTP response, a JSON response, or whatever we need it to do. So a very important file here. So after that, we have our admin or admin.py. This is our admin panel and how we configure things. We'll, we'll get to this later. And then we have our migrations. So migrations is how we configure our models to our actual database. So now that we have our app, the last thing I wanna do here is configure our app to our project. And if we go into settings.py, there is gonna be a variable or a list here called apps here. So apps are simply uh, the apps inside of our application and you can see some by default here. By default, there are actually apps we don't see here configured in Django by default. So these are what Django has set up for us. But to connect our app to our new app, which is called projects, we need to go into the projects folder. So we're going into projects and then we're going into the dot apps file so right here this is the dot apps file it's the configuration for the app itself so we're going into projects dot apps dot project config because that's the configuration class right there so we're just going to connect to it and does someone have a question uh, uh, yeah. sorry i didn't catch what that what that was okay so yeah i was oh. So our, uh, our app is now configured. 
So now Django knows about this project's app. So this is our setup. That's video one. We just ran through all of this and set up our Django project and an app. If anyone has questions, go ahead and ask them. If not, we'll move on to the next section. So I'll start prepping for the next one. Uh, write your messages here or request to chat and then your mic will be unmuted. So I'm just gonna run through the course here. The next video in this process was gonna be, oops. Okay, so the next video was gonna be our views and URLs. So without the explanation, this would take a couple of minutes to set up. This application or this project was pretty easy to get going. All we did was run Django start project and Django start app. Now, this is where a lot of Flask developers kind of crack me up here because they say Flask is very easy to get set up. Well, you can set up a Flask application, but it's going to be a really crappy application. It's not going to be good. So there's still a lot of configuration that has to go with it. So what we're going to do is create some really fast views and URLs, and we're going to compare this to what a Flask developer would do or something like that. So inside of our URLs here, we want to actually return some data to our users. So the first thing is I wanna turn on my server. So I forgot this step in the last part here, but to start our server in our Django project, it's simply, it's as simple as doing python manage.py run server. So this is one of those commands. So when we do run server, let's see, projects config, something went wrong in that setup here. And what did I call my app? I called it projects, projects.apps.projectsconfig. So I forgot an S there. Okay. So we're not going to worry about these unapplied migrations just yet. Our server is now on and it's running on port 8000. So I can copy this and I can just paste that into my browser. What I recommend is you go into your bookmarks and just book it, bookmark it. So that way you can just open up your browser and then click on that port and it'll be there. So this is what Django gives us by default. Now we actually want to return something to our users, uh, something that's going to be uh, real, I guess, something they can actually see that we made, not the default Django stuff. So let's render out some data really quick to our users. So in here, inside of our URLs here, we have our URLs and we just wanna trigger a function that returns back a simple HTTP response, HTTP response, which later turns into a template or will be a template or API data. So this will be from Django.http, import HTTP response. Okay, so now let's create a function and a function is simply going to be a view. We get into class-based views later on in the course. And the only difference is one you write as a class, one you write as a, as a Python function. So we're going to create a function here and let's just call this projects here. So we want to just get all the projects and return them to our user. So inside of a view, in order to actually make this a view and not just a simple Python function, we have to, we have to import or inherit from not inherit from, but we have to pass in the request object. So this is a Django object that Django provides us. And this helps us handle all of our HTTP requests, uh, get header data from those requests and so on. So this makes it a view. So create a function, pass in request into that. And then we just need to return. And here for now, I'm just gonna do HTTP response. And we're just gonna say, this is our projects page. Okay, so that's a view right there. Now we wanna return this back to the user. So what I'm gonna do here is I need to create a route or a URL path here. So this is a list here and we're gonna use the, the path function. And this function takes in a few parameters. The first one is the actual URL that we wanna to go to. So let's say whenever a user goes to our URL and then forward slash projects, what do we wanna do when a user does this? So let's say someone goes to our browser and they just go to this route. So, here, I'm going to mute someone's mic here. Okay, so when someone goes to this route, we want to return back something to the user. So in this case, we're just going to add in a comma into the path function, and we can just do projects, and we can trigger that function. We're not going to instantiate it like that. We just need to throw it in there, and then the path will actually trigger that function for us. So that's it at this point. It takes in two parameters, the route and the function. Uh, if everyone's following, let me know. I just wanna make sure I'm not like going through redundant stuff or boring anyone. Okay, so why am I not doing this in views.py? Good question, I'm gonna. I just wanna show you how a view works before we connect it to the app. And also a lot of Flask developers brag about how fast it is to set up a Flask application. And I'm showing you that it's not much slower to do that in Django. So 
it's going to be the correct way to do this inside of our views.py file but i just want to get it set up here show you how it works and then we'll we'll actually move it so great question actually so this is where django being opinionated is actually a really 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 good thing like i cannot stress that enough because they're teaching us better structure than sticking all of our routes and our urls into one file so okay what's going to happen when someone goes to forward slash projects this function is going to trigger and there the user is going to see an http response that says this is our projects page so let's save that my server is running so now if i go to this route forward slash projects it officially did not connect let's see what's going on here projects let's make sure my server is on so my app is installed projects.appsconfig no that wasn't actually needed let's take that route here try adding the end slash yeah, okay, so there we go. So now when a user goes to projects, this is what we're seeing. So that's all it is. That's an HTTP response to the user. So what if we created another view here? So let's copy this one, and this will be to like a single project. So I'm just gonna take out the S, it's not gonna be plural, and we're just gonna say project page. So now we have two functions or two views, and we're gonna have another URL here. So I'm gonna copy this one. We'll throw in project here. And that's just going to be project for a single project. And we want to trigger this function when a user goes to project. So in this case, let's get rid of that S here. So now this function will trigger this or this URL path will trigger this function. This one right here will trigger this one. So they're correlating to what they're activating here, what they're actually triggering. So now if I go to projects or project without an S, we have a project page. And if I add in the S there, now we see the two pages. So I hope that makes sense. Now, I wanna make a dynamic URL here really quick. So let's say we want a single project, but we wanna pass in like the project ID, because that's typically how you would get it in the URL here. So uh, typically you would have like a route called project, and then it would have like the idea of like 45 or 24, whatever that is. And you would add this value in, and this value would be dynamic. Can you all see that? It's kind of small on my screen. I don't know how I can zoom into that. So you want an ID like that. So to make this dynamic, we're going into our URL here and into angle brackets and then close that with a forward slash, we can add in a dynamic value by simply giving it a name. So this value could be an integer like that. And then we can just say PK here. And this value can also be dynamic, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, this would mean that this value here has to be an integer. We can also do slug. So that can be a slug field. And this can also be a string. I'm going to leave it as a string because later on we're going to use UUIDs. Uh, I believe you, there is actually an option to do that. I think we can actually do UUID, but I'm not sure. So for now, we'll just do a string. So this value can also be dynamic. So we can call it cookies. It doesn't matter. As long as we call it here, that's going to be the name of, our, of that dynamic path here. So for now, I'm going to call it PK for primary key. And then inside of the function, we just need to pass that in as a parameter. So pass that in here and pass it in here. So now what I'm gonna do here is just render that primary key. So I'll just do project page and then we'll just do a colon and then we'll just append a string here and that's gonna be the primary key. So this is how we can query data and render dynamic values out to a page. So now this project route won't work unless we pass in a dynamic value. So if I click on that, now we have project four. I can pass in any number and this number is gonna be rendered out. So that's how we get certain objects and query the database. Anyone have any questions? Uh, give me some kind of response if it's all flowing decently, if you're understanding it. I'd love to get some feedback. So uh, what we're gonna do now that we covered our URLs and our views is we wanna do things the Django way. Remember, Django is opinionated and Django wants us to do things a certain way uh, and that kind of creates a good structure. So as somebody mentioned, uh, that was Ramzit, Ramzit, I believe, or no, that was Andrew asked, why are we not putting this into our views.py? So this is how you typically want to set up your project. All this was done inside of our Django project. But remember, anything to do with projects needs to go into the project app. We want to separate our code. Is it necessary to declare a data type inside of our URLs? Yes, we do. We have to specify that. If I'm wrong, correct me there, but I'm pretty sure we have to specify what kind of data type that has to be. That's a good question, by the way. So let's go into our projects app now, 
And in our projects app, the first thing I want to do is go into the views.py. And I'm going to take all these or these two functions here, including that HTTP response. I'm going to copy that, delete it, and then we're going to put that into our views. So now all of our views are going to sit inside of a views.py file, and this is going to separate our code, make it a lot cleaner. So we'll put that in here. Now we need to connect these. So Praveen is saying most likely not as Python is dynamically typed. So typically, yeah, that's so Praveen is basically saying, let me pull up the question so everyone can see. Praveen is saying that you don't need to typically in Python, uh, but in this case for the URLs, I believe you need to. Okay, so that's more of a Django thing. Okay, so we put our views into our views.py. Now what we need to do is configure our URLs to these views. So in our app, our app is actually going to have its own URLs.py. So we're going to have several URL files in here. So if we look on the left side, we're going into the app, which we called projects. In here, we'll create a new file, and I'm going to call this URLs.py. And in here, I need to set up my URLs. So the first thing I need is that path function. So we'll just do from Django dot URLs, and we're just going to import path here. So we have path, then we need that list here. So we're going to do URL patterns, and then that's going to be a list. So we'll set the variable. And in here, we need to write our first path here. So I'll go into the root directory. So the root directory is my Django project. We'll go in here, we'll go into the original URLs file, and we're going to take these two paths here. We're going to copy them, remove them, and we're going to put them into our apps views or URLs.py file. Again, ask questions because that's the point of a live stream because I say this in the course. So instead of just rehearing this, I would love it for you guys to ask the question so I can um, actually, I guess, address those right away. If you have any doubts, ask them. So we just put our URLs into our apps URLs.py file. And now that my URLs sit inside of views.urls here, so here's the structure, these two routes, I'm gonna go into the URLs.py file. And in order to actually use those views, I'm just going to do from dot and then import views. So I'm just importing this entire file here. Now for the actual functions, I'm just going to add views here because those are in my views folder. So we'll just do views dot projects. And then we're going into views dot project. Oh, I already wrote that out. Okay. So now we're going into that file. So these two routes will trigger these two functions. I hope that makes sense. So to actually connect all this, because we are, this is actually not going to work at this point. What we need to do is we need to go into the root directories URLs file, and we simply need to include this URL pattern into this route. So this is like the core URL pattern. This handles all the URLs for the entire application. So what we could do is we can import a function here called include, and we can simply include this file into here. So we're going to create a path here. And I'm going to set that to an empty string because I want this to be like my home page here. And we're going to set this to include. And we're going to put this in a string and we're going into the projects app. And from the projects app, we're going into that URLs.py file. So projects.urls. So now if somebody goes to our root domain, they're going to be sent in here. And this page is going to take care of all of that routing. So if I save this, let's just go ahead and refresh that. It's still working. Perfect. Now my URLs are in a different file, but they are still working. But what happens when I go to the homepage? So right now, because I have some URLs configured, it's telling me, hey, I only see the admin route, I see projects and project. So to actually make this work, because we're sending a user to an empty string, which is the homepage or the root URL, we're just gonna go ahead and set the projects page to our homepage. So now if somebody goes to this route here, so if they go from the root directory into this file, if they go here, the home page is going to be our projects. Okay. So let's refresh that and then let's go through some questions. So now it's all working. That's our home page, port 8000, and then project, and then whatever we want to pass in. So now that that's a string, so we did a string for the data type, so we can pass in whatever we want here. Okay, so I see a question. Uh, say if we have a function related to an app rather than creating a different app in the root directory, in the root directory, can we include a new app handles sub function inside of the main app folder? I'm not fully understanding the question. Let me see. Uh, if uh, Praveen and Abhi, if you understand that, let me try to reread that. If we have a function yeah, related to an app, that. what's that? 
Yeah, I'm reading that. Uh, you can continue. Okay, yeah. I'll answer that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you can answer that in the chat or even just speak up now, that'd be that that would work so everyone can hear it. Um, but it's also gonna be in the chat too. So, okay, so let's move on here. So we set up our URLs and views and we put them into different apps now. And what did we do next in the course here? So we configured that. And now what I wanna do is actually render out some templates. So this is kind of the interesting thing. I, uh, I actually got a comment from someone yesterday talking about Django in 2021 and basically saying that it's so outdated to use HTML templates. Why not just use Django for APIs and then uh, configure configure the uh, the front end framework or whatever you wanna use. That's totally a possibility. Like in theory, if you don't wanna work with the Django templating engine, you can skip the entire templates section here. You don't need to do this. This is one way of doing it. Uh, I teach this to beginners because it's still a very valuable thing to know. Like the, the thing that that person said wrong in the comments section was no one uses templates anymore. I can think of so many templates and I can point out so many companies that still use templates and don't even have an API. Uh, think about a dentist requesting some kind of application just to store customer data or uh, patient data. There's a good chance that you won't even need an API for that and no front end framework. So build out to the application that you're trying to solve rather than just following a structure because that's what everyone said. So templates are still useful. That's why we cover them and we're gonna talk about the Django templating engine right now. So let's go ahead and set this up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is render out some templates. So I need to go ahead and go into my root directories file. There's a few ways to configure templates in Django. Uh, the first one is just to create a folder inside of the root directory. So Ron folder. Uh, basically in here, go ahead and create a new folder. So in the same project as your Django project and call that template. So not into a specific app. So if I were to show you that folder structure, here we go. It's sitting right here with all my other files here. So we see dev search live, my virtual environment, my app and a templates folder. So that's the structure here. So now we need to add in some templates and uh, just curious, how is everyone's HTML and CSS? I'd actually be curious to get feedback on that. So um, yeah, write that in the chat section. That'd be cool to see. So for our templates, this is where we're gonna store all HTML templates or at least some of them actually. So in here, the first thing I wanna do is create a projects.html. And uh, let's just say something like projects. We'll worry about the uh, HTML structure later. We'll just say projects here. And let's create a single project HTML. So we'll just do single project.html. So now we have two templates. And just to show that this is a template, we'll just say project, and then um, I'll just add in a P tag, and I'm not using Emmet, so I'll just look up some lorem ipsum text. Emmet is just a plugin that helps you create some text faster and helps working with HTML easier. But for now, we'll just get some dummy data. I just Googled up lorem ipsum. Let's take this right here, and let's stick that into this paragraph tag. Okay, so I just wanted to show that this is a template. So now we have our two templates. We have one for all of our projects and one for a single project. Now to render a template, what I'm gonna do is go into, let's close these out actually. Let me save that so it doesn't make that noise. Okay, so let's go into our views now and instead of returning back a simple HTTP response, we don't wanna do that, that doesn't really do anything for us. We're gonna use this render method. It's a shortcut that Django gives us and we're gonna render a template. So in return, Let's go ahead and remove HTTP response and we'll just do render. So in here, I just need to specify the request object here. So we'll pass in request and we need to specify the template. So the template we wanna render is gonna be the projects.html template. And I'm gonna save that. And now what I need to do is tell Django where to find this template here. So templates are configured inside of our Django project in settings.py. Second time we're referring back to this file now. So in templates, there's going to be an attribute called DIRS, so that's directories, and we're going to use the OS module, so I'm just going to import that. So we're going to import OS, and we need to set a path to our templates. So this is actually more of an old school way of doing it, but I know a lot of people for some reason have an issue uh, with Django's new file path system, so I'll just make sure no one has an issue with it. So we're going to import OS, and then we can go into our templates here and inside of this templates directory, we can actually add in an entire list here and we'll just do os.path and then we can do dot join and let's render the template. So in this case, we're going into our base directory. So there's this variable here, baster. That's just gonna tell us to go out here into this root directory. 
So we'll go into that root directory and then we wanna get that templates folder. So we're just telling Django we have templates here. So we'll just do base underscore dir and then we're telling it go into this folder right here. That's where we store templates. Now Django knows where to find templates. So when I trigger this function, it's not gonna throw an error because it's gonna go into that folder and look for a template called projects.html. So let's go ahead and uh, refresh that page here and let's see what we have. So there we go, we have our projects. That's not an HTTP response, that is a template. So if I were to go ahead and grab this text here, so we'll go into single project, I'll grab this paragraph tag. So let's grab all this and I'll probably have to put out an HTML and CSS tutorial, like something short, just to make sure everyone's caught up if anyone's lost here. So now if I refresh it, there we go. We actually have a template, so we can actually customize it. Now we can actually load information into our templates here. So that's why we wanna use templates and not a simple HTTP response. Probably more beginner, but I wanted to make sure to cover that. So we rendered out our templates, and in that, uh, in that project here, or in the tutorial, we also talked about template inheritance and including. So template inheritance, very powerful thing. Uh, we're able to create like components of our application and we're also able to inherit from like a main theme. So one example would be like this navigation bar. So imagine every single page in this application, imagine having to take our HTML code and paste this or rebuild this nav bar in every page. What happens when we change the logo or when we change a link here? We would have to go into every single page and we would have to update the HTML, which would be absurd to do that. There'd be a lot of errors. It's a lot of work. So what we wanna do is we wanna create one file for our nav bar and simply include it into our application. So uh, we're inheriting, it's like a parent-child relationship. So let's go ahead and take care of that. And by the way, uh, there is another way to render templates. So let's actually get into that first, sorry. I actually forgot about that. So with Django, instead of storing all of our templates inside of the templates folder, uh, this can get messy too, again, when we add multiple apps, when we have uh, over you know, 50 templates in an application, that's totally possible. Uh, this file will get very messy. So to do things the Django way, which Django recommends that we separate our code into different applications and different folders, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go into our project here or into our app, and inside of our app, we're gonna create a new folder and we're gonna call this template. So this is where our templates for a specific app is gonna be stored. So when we create a user's app, any app that has to do with our users is gonna be stored in here. So the weird thing about this is Django already pre-configures it for us so we won't have to go into settings.py and let it know about this file. Django already has this built in so what they do is they just tell us to build in a folder called templates and that spelling has to be that way. And then in that templates folder, we need to create another folder with the app name. So in this case, our app is called Projects. If anyone has questions here, uh, do ask. I know this confuses some people. So if we go into the project here, uh, we have our app right here, then we have templates, and then Projects, and then all those templates will be stored in here. So let's go ahead and actually move all of those. So I'm gonna go into a project again, and I'm gonna go into the templates folder, and we're still gonna use this folder, but we're just gonna move these HTML files into the projects page because they have something specific to do with that application or with that app. And this templates folder will be for any template or part of a template that is used in multiple applications. So I'm just gonna copy this, and we're gonna move this into our projects app, templates, projects, and we'll paste it in there. And then I'll go back into the root directory, and we're just gonna remove these files from here. So just to make sure everyone's no one's confused here, we took those files out of the templates folder and we put them into projects, templates, and then projects. So now they're in here. Some people get confused there. Okay, so if we do this, we have to do something different with our views because now if I refresh it, we still have the templates, but this is gonna throw an error. So now it tells us, hey, a template doesn't exist. This is a common error. You'll see this a lot. A lot of beginners see it. Uh, it just means that it can't find the template or that that template truly doesn't exist. As far as Django knows, it doesn't exist. So what we need to do now is we need to point the route to our app here. So we just need to go to projects and then take project.html. So that's why Django is asking that we name a folder inside of our templates folder called projects. It needs to know where to find it. So we need to do the same for this next one. So let's actually save this and make sure it's working. 
So there we go. So now it's pointing to the template, but it's in a different folder. So let's just render this one out first. So we'll just do render. We pass in requests. So you pass in request into the render function. And then we're going into projects forward slash. This was single dash project dot HTML. Okay, so I just want to make sure both templates are being rendered. Let's do forward slash project. And then we need to pass in some kind of ID. Okay, so there we go. Single project. Something went wrong with this template. Let's see. So it looks like it's rendering the wrong template when I go to a project. Single project.html doesn't exist. Let's see. Single project. Okay, so that was just named wrong, so I'll fix this naming. Okay, so I'm seeing some conversations going in the chat. Let's see if those are relevant to me. Okay, so that looks like it's just Praveen. It looks like it's between Praveen and someone else. Okay, so we have the templates. We also have two different ways of rendering the templates. The first one is to create a templates folder, connect that inside of settings.py. So inside of our project in settings.py, we connect it right here. Or the other way is to put it inside of your apps. If we put it in our apps, we put it into a folder called templates, then the app name, and then we simply have to change our routes to that render method. So now let's talk about inheritance. So a navigation bar is going to be used inside of every app. We're going to use the same nav bar across all apps. So that can go into the root directories templates folder. So let's go ahead and create a new template. And this is going to be called navbar.html. And let's just create some kind of navigation bar. We'll just do an h1 tag. Uh, let's just say logo. And then let's just create an HR. So some kind of line break just so we can see it. So this is what our nav bar is going to look like. Uh, long term here. So we have that set up. So we have our logo and we want to make sure this nav bar is inside of every page. So to make sure this is all in all of our pages, we can go into our templates here. So I'll go into my projects here and we can include it and we'll talk about the Django templating engine syntax. So uh, that uses Jinja and we'll talk about that later, but just write these curly braces if you're following along. And we're just going to do curly braces, 2% symbols, that's called a tag. And then we're just going to say include, and this is a specific tag. So this is the tag name. So we're saying include. And then because I used or in here, I'm going to do single quotes in here. Uh, I just need to point to the template we want to use. So in this case, we're going into nav bar .html like that. So now what's going to happen here is this code right here will be included inside of my projects page. So if I save that and refresh it, so in the projects page, there we go. We see our logo. So that's not actually in the HTML code. We just included it. And now we can use this anywhere. If I wanted to put this down here, uh, I can include it multiple times in a page. Just copy and paste that a bunch and look at that. So makes for things or makes things pretty cool here. I like doing that. It uh, cleans up our code a lot. We're not repeating ourselves. So now let's talk about template inheritance. So Still seeing the conversation and it looks like it's still between Praveen and someone else. So template inheritance means that I'm not going to have to include this code inside of every template because if I wanted to reuse this, I would still have to go into my single project page and then I'd have to put it in here and that works. It still makes it easier because now I'm not having to update the nav bar in every page. I just have to include it. But what if I just wanted to create one template that all the templates inherit from and then maybe include this nav bar into that main template. So for this, we're just going back into our templates here. This is going to be a root directory template and I'm going to create a new template and I'll call this main.html. So all our templates will inherit from this. So in this, I'm just actually going to create my HTML structure. So if you start typing in HTML in most text editors, it should give you the boilerplate files. I'm just going to modify this. So don't worry about the details. So this is typically how you want to make an HTML page. And let's just configure this. So I'm just going to comment out my script tag here and my link. So what we want to do here is we want to take this nav bar and I'm going to take it out of projects here. So I'm just going to remove it, copy it. And I want to put that into my main template. So now the nav bar is included in my main template. Now, if I want other templates to inherit from this template, I need to specify where that data will go because that main template is pretty much going to wrap all this code inside of like a block tag 
and it's gonna put this code inside of that, if that makes sense. It's like a parent-child relationship. So let's try to explain here. So in order to actually inherit from this template, we need to use block tag. So block a tag, a block of code can go inside of these tags. So we'll just do block content, and then we need to close it, and we need to create a closing tag. So we'll just do end block. So we're letting that know that it's ending, and then we're specifying the content that's gonna be closed up. So every single page that we add will go inside of here. So it's gonna fit in here and this will almost like wrap it. It'll be like a parent to it. It's almost like a object inheritance. So to actually inherit from this template, now that we have these two tags, all we need to do, so we have to do this if we wanna inherit from it, we have to go into our template that we want to inherit from or the template that we want to use this main template or the, the page, I guess. And we just need to use extends. So we're saying that this page is going to extend a template. Then we need to specify which template and this is going to be main. So main dot HTML. So let me try something here. So the first thing is I'm just going to go ahead and save this and check out what the page looks like. So we extended it. And now this template is going to be inside of this page. So if I refresh this, we see our logo and that's it. Why do we see our logo? So our logo is here because we included it in the page here. So what about all of this content? Why don't we see this? So that's not showing up because we don't know where we're putting that child content. We haven't specified that yet. So in our main template, we said put all child content in these two block tags. So in any template that we inherit from or the child template, what we need to do is wrap the content and tell it where it's going to be. So we can just do block content. And we're just wrapping all our HTML code. That's all we're doing. And then we're just doing end block. So just like we did in the main template. So end block content. Okay, so if I save that, now all this content will appear inside of here, inside of these two block tags. And for some reason, I'm not seeing the closing paragraph tag, so I'll probably just add that in manually before that gives me an error. So we'll add that, and here we go. So this is all being wrapped around with these two block tags and we're extending from this template. So now if I refresh this, there we go. So what if we wanna to go to our single project page? Let's just quickly create a link here. So we'll just uh, add in two links here. We'll create an a tag here. And we're gonna make these links dynamic later. I just wanna show you how to do this. So we'll just say project. And that's obviously only gonna to go to one project. And we'll just create a href and this is going into project forward slash. And we'll just give it an ID of like four. So that'll be that the dynamic route. And I also wanna go home too. So what I'll do is create a home link here. So we'll just go to projects and then we'll say home. Everyone following along? I'm not putting you all to sleep. How are you uh, doing Praveen and Abhi? <laughs> all right, so we have our two links here. So what happens when we go to the project page? So when we go here and I just hard coded the value, it looks like the link's not working. Give me one second. So. Oh, that's going to the home page like that and then we're going to project okay so let me remove the nav bar from the project page and let's try that one more time so i'm going to save everything here save the nav bar the main template need to revisit okay so still a conversation you guys keep throwing me off <laughs> okay so so we have our home page and we have our project page. So you notice how the project page doesn't have this navigation bar. Well, the whole point of extending is so we can reuse code. Uh, there's something called dry, which stands for don't repeat yourself. It's a coding term for anybody that's not familiar with it. We don't wanna have to rewrite our code here. So in this case, what we need to do is go into the single project page now, and we also need to extend the template over here. So we'll just do extends, and then this is going into main.html. That's the template we'll extend. And then we just wrap this in here. So we'll just do block content. Close that up here. End block content. All right. So now this page should extend it. So there we go. So now the single project page. Why does it say projects? I'm a little bit confused here. I see an issue. So it looks like we have a bug here. Single projects. Okay. So that should say single project. That's why it's confusing me. It's a single project. We'll save that and let's check it out. So we have our homepage, which is the projects and then single project and they both extend the main template. Now the cool thing about this is that if I wanna add some styling, let's say I wanna make my background color like uh, blue or something like that, we'll just use some ugly color, but that's obvious. Uh, in the head tag, 
all I would do is just add in a link here or a style tag, which later on will be external CXS. And we'll just do body and inside of the body tag, I'll just say background color. So background color, we'll just set this to blue. So we'll save that. So now I style the main template. I'm not adding styling to projects or single project, but any kind of styling that I put in here, all the child templates. So anything that inherits from this template will take on that styling. So if I go to this page, I styled one page and that looks horrid right now. But uh, if I style one page, all the pages will have it. So let's try to use a color that's a little bit more visible or let's just say color for text here will be white. So we'll just do FFF. That should give me a white hex here and we'll say gray for the background color or maybe use a, a less aggressive blue. Okay, so now both pages have the styling. So that's the beauty of that. So we don't have to add styling into every page. Okay, so that covers the templates and template inheriting. I think that was it. I probably should look at my notes here. Uh, but let's go ahead and move on to rendering data in templates. So now we want to actually output some data. So what I'm going to do here is just change the colors. Let's just take out styling. We'll just remove it. We'll revert back to where we're at. Uh, how are we doing? Feedback will always help me. Let me know. Give me a thumbs up. Uh, ask a question. Um, if you want to speak up too, by the way, just request it in the chat. So go to questions and say, I would like to ask one in the voice chat and uh, we'll unmute your mic and you can ask the question. So while that's being done, let me pull up some notes here. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. So I'll actually go to my video notes, the ones that I used for the original tutorial, and I'll just make sure I'm not skipping any important parts here. Praveen, Abhi, can you guys, uh, can y'all hear me? Are they still in here? Yeah, yeah, no, we could hear you. Praveen uh, had to leave, he's in vocal. Oh, I see, cool. Yeah, Abhi, if you have to go too, let me know. I just, I don't want to hold you here. No, I, I can stay around. I'm just uh, losing a little connection, but uh, I should be good in a couple of minutes. I'm just fixing my internet. Gotcha, okay, cool. If anyone else is losing connection, let me know too. I'd love to make sure we're not just going with bad connection. Okay, so I'm just pulling up some other notes here. What's up? Did you see the question on the, did you see the question in uh, the, uh, about uh, the best way to organize your templates, whether it's inside an directory? I mean, took a, uh, like a stab at it, but I just wanted to see if you had anything to say too. Sure, yeah, good question. Okay, so the question is, what's the best structure? Was that the question, right? Which I'm trying yeah. to find exactly where was that? Who was it asked by? Let me pull up. I'm sorry if I'm wrecking your name, but the question was, what was the best practice to keep the template inside the app or the root directory? Okay, so really good question. So the way I would follow this, I would say is if your template or that portion of a template is gonna be used across multiple apps, put it into your root directory. So if it's not tied to a specific app, put it inside of here. So put it into the templates folder and configure that in settings.py. I've seen people put templates in here. And again, you can in theory do it however you want. This is the cool thing about Django is they're trying to give you that advice. Django is saying that any template like main.html, which is gonna be used across multiple apps and so is a nav bar, put them in here. Any template, associated with a specific app. At this point, we only have one, we have the projects app. But if it's specifically associated with this app, like it's a projects page or a form for a project, put it into this file. Now in theory, what you could do is you can go into templates and then you can create a folder called projects and you can say, this is where all of my, uh, all of my templates to the projects app will sit. That's totally fine too. You'll just have to go into the views and configure that routing here. But the best way to do it is to separate it. This is how Django recommends it, is to separate your code into main templates and then anything to do with your app, put it into the apps templates folder. Good, that's a really good question actually. Okay, so I'm just pulling up the notes here. Give me a second. I'm also using this to take a little breather. Usually when I'm recording, I give myself a minute to breathe in between sections, but now I'm just having to rapid fire everything. Okay, one second here. 
I almost feel like I deleted the notes somewhere. Oh, okay, never mind. Now I found them. I just had it named wrong. Okay, so we just did templates and template inheriting. Now we're going to talk about rendering data. So what I'm going to do is pull up the GitHub repo. And let's just go to github.com. And then we're going into Django 2021. So this is a live GitHub repo. So if you want to use this, this code, you can. So in here, in the resources folder, I talk about this in the introduction video. We are going to render some projects into the template. And before we do that, we're just going to use some static data. So we're just going to go in here. Let's uh, move this to the left here. So let's go ahead and go in, in here. So I'm not having to type all this out. And let's just get a list of dictionaries. So we see one dictionary, two, and three. So these are going to represent like objects. So let's just copy that. And let's bring that into my code here. Drag that in this screen. So let's just bring that inside of our views. So we're just going to use this temporarily. So we have the variable name called projects list and then our data in here. So before we get started with this, I want to talk about tags in Jinja. And I feel like this is where we're going to start getting some more questions. So tags in Jinja, let's just pull this up. So let's just do Django templating engine or Django templates. That should work. So just Google up the documentation. Use this link right here. So I'm going to paste this in the questions here. That's the documentation. And for those of you that don't see the questions chat, I just pasted that in here. So that's in my screen so zoomed in, but that's in the chat section or the questions channel. Okay, so here's the templating engine. So Jinja, this is what Django uses. It just customizes Jinja a little bit. It's using Jinja too. This is a templating engine that allows you to, I guess, to sum it up, write logic in your templates. So you can pass in variables, you can create uh, if, and answer or, uh, if statements for loops that kind of stuff so in our case it's customized to write python like logic in our templates so there's two things we have in the syntax the first one is we have variables which are going to be these double curly braces so in this sentence right here you will see my name is and then first name and then my name my last name is and then the last name variable so if we use a dictionary we pass this in all we would need to do is pass in the values like this and then you'd see my name or my first name is John. My last name is Doe. So if Sally were to put in her name here, it would be my first name is Sally. Last name is Doe or whatever. So it makes things dynamic. So that way, when you render your profile, that's why you see your own profile name. You're using these variables to output that. So just variables there. And then uh, if we're accessing a dictionary, we can still use the dot notation. So we can do like object dot, you know, attribute. So it'd be like person dot name and values like that. Now there's also something called tags. Tags are these things with these curly braces and this percent symbol. And tags basically allow us to write Python like logic. And there's also built in tags that we're using. For example, we used the include tag or the extends tag right here. So we see the tag there and then the actual tag name. We see the block tag. And those are the only two we used at this point. So these are tags. So an example would be like this. If a user is authenticated, you wanna say hello to them. So if user is authenticated, say hello, pass in that variable name. And the weird thing about this is you have to end if, or you have to close out your tag. So anytime you create a tag, you typically have to close it, not for all of them, but for statements like this. So if we write a for loop, you'd have to do for, write your loop, and then do an end for. So Django needs to know, or the template needs to know where you end it. So in this case, we won't go into too much more here. We'll just start writing this out. There's also something called filters where you can do a pipe here and then write the filter name. There's some built-in ones. So yeah, that's the Django templating engine. It uses Jinja. So take a look at that, look into the documentation. So let's start adding that. So let's go in here. And the first thing we're gonna do is we'll start with this projects list here. So I wanna use this and I wanna pass this into my template. So before we actually start with that, I'm gonna say name and I'm gonna say Dennis. So we'll just test this out. So add my name and to pass this in the template, we need to create something called a context dictionary. In theory, I can just create a dictionary like this and I can say name and that will be the name variable. So the key is how you'll address it in the template. And if all this is familiar to you, let me know. I am pretty much repeating what I'm doing in the course. So I don't want to uh, bore you here, but we have a dictionary here. And what I'm going to do is I like to just name my dictionary. So we'll just do context and that's like context data in the template. 
and that's how we're going to use it. So we'll just take this variable and we'll pass this in here. Yeah, we are getting a recording on, in this, or I am recording this right now. I'm just making sure the recording, yeah, it's still recording. We're good, so I'll upload it. Uh, this is also in the course, obviously, too. But uh, okay, so we have our context dictionary. So we create the dictionary, we pass it in. So it's the third parameter in the render method. Let me know if you have any questions. So now to actually use this in the template, I can go into the projects template. So let me close out my files here. We'll go into project and uh, let's actually just get rid of all of this. So we'll just say project and we'll just say, uh, I'll just add in an H1 tag and then we'll say name and pass in that variable. So we'll just say name like that. So now if I go into my template, let's go into projects here. So there we, see, there we see name is Dennis Ivanov. If I change this to, let's see, back in the, the views, if I change this to John, it would update it. So we'll just do John. Really good picture, Praveen. I like that actually. So I'm guessing that's answering the templates questions. So there we go, that's our variables. Now what if I added in a name? So let's write in some conditions. So we'll just say, or an age. So we'll say age, I am currently 27. So we'll pass in age here. So it's just a dictionary. We'll say age and then the value. And let's just go ahead and output something. So we'll just create an if statement. So anytime we're creating an if statement, we're just doing uh, if, and then we pass in the condition. So we'll just say if age is greater than 27. And now we just have to create an end if. So that's the weird part, end if. And now we're writing Python-like logic in our templates. So in here, if age is 27, we'll say with a H5 tag here or H4, we'll say Dennis is older than 27. I really wanna know if this is useful to everyone because it's like, I'm repeating what, what I'm doing in the course. I'm trying to elaborate. This is where I love the questions uh, because I can't elaborate. But if, I, if you feel like this is redundant, let me know. Um, we wouldn't wanna do something if, uh, if it wasn't valuable. So right now, my age is not over 27. Uh, so we're not seeing this. So we're only gonna output this if my age is over 27. So if I were to change the age to, let's say I turn 30 here. If I refresh it, now we see it. So let's continue this. So we can write in an LIF statement. So we'll just say LIF, so a Python LIF statement. LIF age is equal to 27, we'll just say Dennis is 27. So just like that. And then we can write our else statement. So the else statement, we'll just go right here. We'll just do the two curly braces, the percent symbol, else, and we'll just copy this right here and we'll say Dennis is under 27. Okay, so let's try that. So if I change the age to 27, let's see what we get. There we go, Dennis is 27. If I change the age to 26, let's rewind back to 2020. And there we go, Dennis is under 27. So we have some conditions and now we wanna loop through some data. So what I'm gonna do is get rid of all of this. We have our variable, we have our conditions, our if else statements, and now we wanna create a for loop. So what I'm gonna do is take these projects, we have this variable, and we're just gonna pass that into our context dictionary. So I'll just remove all that. Let's just comment that out. And we're just gonna get rid of all this. And I'm gonna say projects and we'll pass in projects list. So I pasted that in here. That was from the GitHub repo. So you, you have the link here. If you have the course, you have full access to that. That's in the resources folder. So now to actually loop through this, let's go ahead and create a table here. So we'll create a table and we're gonna create a table head. In that table head, we'll create a table row. Now in that table row, we want some table columns, which are gonna be header columns, and we'll just say uh, ID, and we'll create three columns here. So we'll do ID, title, and then description. Okay, so to output this content dynamically, now we're gonna create a table body. So T body, close that up. And what we want to do is on each iteration of the loop, we're going to create a for statement. So on each iteration, we're going to create a new row. So we'll just say for project, and we can call this variable whatever whatever we want. We can call it i. Uh, so we can do for i in projects or for project in projects. 
So we have access to projects because we passed them into our context dictionary, which we got from this variable. So we're going through this and we're simply just going to output these. So end four. And now what do, what do we want to do on each iteration? Well, we'll take that table row and we're going to create a row on each iteration. Now this right here is going to be a variable. So we can actually pass that in here and access each one of these keys. So we're going to access the ID, the title and the description. So we'll just go ahead and create the variable that's double curly braces. We'll pass in project. So this is how we can output dynamic values. So we'll do project dot title. Let's take this right here, paste that in, and we'll just do description. Let's make that a lowercase d. Okay, so description was supposed to go here, title supposed to go here, and that's supposed to be ID. So we just accessed each one of these three attributes on each iteration. So now if I refresh this, there we go. So we can see that I'm a little bit zoomed in, but we see the ID row the title row and the description. I'm not sure why everything's centered, but that doesn't matter. We're not worrying about HTML. Oh, okay, so that's a table header. So that should be a table row or the column should be TD inside of the rows. So that's why it was bolded. Okay, so unimportant stuff, but we see it. So what's the question? No, not a question. I just wanted to add something with the if statements and with Jinja. I guess like when you could kind of like infer you could be, like Dennis mentioned, very dynamic. Like for instance, if you were building something like Airbnb, you could, you know, add the super host tag if, you know, they have a certain number of reviews. So you could get really dynamic with the data that you're rendering um, with, you know, Jinja syntax. I mean, that could be, it, it, it could be just as basic as that is just all I wanted to add it. Yeah, good point. So let's, uh, let's think of an example. Let's actually try that. So uh, let's say, Let's say this was a, let's just do, let's create an attribute inside of this projects list and we'll say top rated and I'll just camel case that. And uh, we'll just create a true or false statement. I really like that point. So top rated, this one will be true. The portfolio website, let's just say that sucked. So it's not gonna be top rated. So we'll just say false here. I need to add in a comma. I'm really glad you brought that point up. So I wanna show you how to do that in a loop. So that needs to be in quotes here just a dictionary and then whoops and then top rated for this next section let's also say true okay so now we have two projects that are top rated one that is not so I can go in here and I haven't thought this through but it should be pretty simple so what I could do is add in a true or false value or how about this anytime a project is top rated we'll just add in a little note here so let's just do this we'll just go into the title here or after the title we can write a condition directly in here so after this variable we'll create that if statement so we'll just say if project dot let's see project dot top rated so that's just a true or false value so if I just do project dot top rated and that'll render it out based on the value of it so I can just do and if then I can just say top rated. So we'll just create like a strong tag or something like that. And typically this would be like a star or some kind of icon that you want to give this user and we'll just say top rated. Okay, so let me refresh that. So in this loop right here, we check if a project's top rated. So we just do if top rated, which is true or false. And then we have an end if statement. If it's true, we say top rated. So it's a little note and typically that would, be, that would look different in styling. But if I refresh that, Let's go ahead and try that again. Looks like I'm getting an error. Okay, top rated, true, something happened here. That needs to be like that. I thought that looked funny. Wait, hold on, what am I doing here? No, that's not right. Okay, so I'm missing a comma right here. Yeah, yeah that's what it was, okay. I'll often do that in tutorials where I'm like, oh, that looked funny to me and I completely mess it up even more and just look stupid. <laughs> Okay, so the beauty of it is I can cut it out. Okay, top rated, true. Uh, I still left this one. Okay, so that should get rid of those errors. So now if I refresh this, the page just broke. So here we go. This project is top rated. This one is not. This one is. So just st uh, conditions inside of the actual loops here. Okay, so we passed in data. We went through conditions, loops, variables, 
let's see, what else were we gonna cover here? So uh, the next one is to render a single project. So what happens when we go to this project page? So what I wanna do is show you how to get a project from the database. So before we actually move on to building the database, which we'll do in the next section, uh, let's actually render a single project. So when I go to this page, I wanna get a project by its ID value and render that out here. So in this case, we're gonna hard code this because we don't actually have any data yet in our database. So we're just gonna access this dictionary here and we're gonna put that out into the template. So what I wanna do is create a variable and I'm gonna call this project uh, object. I just don't want it to be the same name as the view. So we'll just do project object. And we're gonna set that to none by default. So it's just gonna be a true or a none value if there's nothing there. And we're just gonna loop through the projects list. So we'll just say for i in project list. So the list that we imported projects list. Let me fix that. Let's go ahead and find a value here. So we'll just say if i, and then we'll go into the id value. So we're going into the attribute. So if the id, keep doing curly braces. So if the id matches whatever we have in the pk value, so whatever we pass into the URL, we're looking for a project that has this id. So if we have it, then we'll actually get it. And I'm going to make that a string value because I believe the URL is going to pass that as a string because that's how I set that data type. And then we're just going to go ahead and say if the project ID in this loop matches what we passed into the URL here, let me just separate this. Then let's just go ahead and set the project object to that specific instance of it. So I, so that's going to be the actual object that it finds here. So we're just getting that value and something's off here. So for I in projects list, we check if the ID matches what's in the URL. If it does, then that's not gonna be none. So now I just need to pass this into the context dictionary in here. I'll just do that just like this. So we'll just do project and then we'll pass in the project object. So we throw that in. Now, if we have a project, we can reference that in the template. So in the template, We'll go into singleproject.html and let's just do this. Let's take this h1 tag and let's just say project.title. So we're passing in data and then this is going to be project.description. So inside of a variable here, we'll do project.description. Okay, so let's try this. So right now, if I go to a value that doesn't exist, so if I go to a project that has an ID of four. We don't have one here, so it's not gonna give me anything. So if I refresh it, right now we're passing this ID in, I see nothing. But if I go into the value of three, we get social network. If I get two, we get portfolio website and so on. So what's happening here is we pass in the URL, which is passed in to the URLs.py file. We have this dynamic value that we called PK. Then inside of the view, we get that from this PK parameter. So that's gonna be one, two, three, four, whatever it is. We go through the projects list and we find a project that has that ID. Later on, we'll actually make database queries, but that's how we're gonna get it for now. So does that make sense to everyone how we, how we did that? Cause we're about to move on to the next section. Just give me a thumbs up if that worked. Not if that worked, but if that makes sense here, if you're following along. So let's close this out, the templating engine. So I guess we're done at this point. Do you all wanna continue? I guess this is where I'll really need your feedback. I can go ahead and uh, I can actually go into the next section. I can go into building the database and rendering out some data from the database here. So let me just open that up. If you all have energy, if you're not tired of this by this point, we can move on. If anything, we can save this for, a, uh, for next week. We can do the stream then, or maybe even later into this week. I can't hear you, Abby. I think I may have disconnected my audio. Or maybe. No, I'm not saying anything. I oh, just, okay. Just, yeah, no, I'm here. I just, I'm just unmuting myself. That's all. Just waiting. I see a couple people typing, so I guess we'll. Okay, we have one person that said next week. Um, I think next week would be best. Yeah, it looks like we got a lot of content from you. Cool. All right. So the recording at this point is going to be an hour and fifty minutes of content. Cool. So we'll save it. Uh, I really, if you all have feedback and how I can do this, I would love to see this in the general chat and the uh, questions channel. I really want to improve this. My goal here is really to, uh, to soak in all this information and make sure you're all getting the most value out of this. So 
questions that I can't answer in the course. I don't want to just rebuild a course. I really want to go back and forth with the audience. So maybe if you have questions ahead of time, send them to me. I'll be going through the comment sections. Remember that in the course, there is a chat here. So if I go to framework, a, a specific uh, section here, there is a comment section. So I'm seeing people commenting. Uh, we see I'm replying to people here. So add something here. Uh, later on, the admins will be responsive in here too. We'll add them to the project here. But if I see stuff here, I'll know what to address. So yeah, I, I really hope this was helpful. We'll end it now. I guess I'm getting a little bit a little bit tired here. We'll start this next week. And I'm even thinking about live streaming this on YouTube and uh, basically only letting the premium members, anybody who bought the course interact here. But we'll see, we'll figure out how to do this. But yeah, any feedback would be great. I'd absolutely love it. Thank you all for joining. I'm gonna end the recording. We can keep chatting after, but for now I'll end the recording unless somebody has a question specifically related. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I uh, just wanna say we do have one question that said, um, what is exactly the relationship between URLs and views? So, I mean, I, okay, so I tried to explain that earlier, but views and URLs. So what happens when someone goes to a specific view? So that, or I'm sorry, not view, but URLs or a URL here. So for example, in this course, you're seeing this route here. It might be a little bit small, but someone's going to dennisivy.teachable.com forward slash courses and then this route. Something needs to occur. If we, have no, if we have nothing else, we're just typing in a URL and nothing happens. So the relationship here is that a view is simply a function that tells the application, it tells a server what to do when that endpoint is hit. So the view is a function that, that actually returns something. So in our case, we see, we see, a, um, we see a template rendered. Uh, later on, we'll have to query the database if we wanna run a calculation. Let's say we're building out a social application or a social networking application. Uh, the user will get back a feed. So the view is basically like the business logic of what happens when a URL is triggered. Now, if you're coming from any other framework like Flask or um, there was a Node.js and Express, they have like these, uh, they're not decorators, they just have functions that basically already associate the URL in them. Like in, in Node.js, you do something like app.get and then you type in the URL path. So the function and the URL are actually like configured together. Django does a really good job of separating our code into components. So later on, when we have all these URLs here, so let's say our page is gonna start looking like this. That's the thing here. We're gonna see our routes or our URL patterns get really busy. The file here is not gonna include any of those functions. We're not gonna have to build those indirectly so it keeps the page clean. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, but they're associated with functions to trigger some kind of response for the user to see. Yeah, let, let me know yeah. if that answered. And I, I appreciate the comment too. I, 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 I think, um, okay, cool. Yeah, he said it answered, that's good. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in my opinion, we should kind of close it off here and then uh, we could answer questions throughout chat and then throughout the next live streams that are down the line, I guess. Cool, alrighty, sounds good. I will end it. I'll uh, see everyone later then, see you next week. And uh, just when you're talking to each other, remind everyone that there is this stream. I'm trying to send out an email, but I also don't want to blast everybody's email. So yeah, we'll go ahead and disconnect it. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming out.